So if I've timed this correctly, I've just released two videos at the same time. The second video is linked in the description and it's a chat with this man who goes by the name of Clear Cognition and believes that evolution is faith-based and should be treated as such. Now this video marks the beginning of a new series of videos for me that are going to be in addition to and not instead of my normal content. I'll be inviting uh, flat earthers, creationists, etc. on for a bit of a chat and then I will follow that chat up by making an educational scientific video on the subject at hand, so in this case evolution. And then I will invite that guest back to see if my video has had any effect on their opinion. So let's begin. So what is my best proof that amazing creatures like this have evolved through evolution and not creation? Well, my favourite proof is this little fella. Hello, silly flatties. Oh, hello. Oh no, sorry. No, I didn't mean him. I mean this fella. This is a retrovirus, and by the time I finish this video, I don't think anybody could deny he is superb scientific evidence for evolution. So what does a retrovirus do? Well, a retrovirus will enter a host cell and release its own genetic material in the form of RNA. And if you're not sure what RNA is, think of it as a single strand of DNA. Amazing. Okay, thanks, but that wasn't the evidence for evolution. I've, I've not explained it yet. I'm not really into science. Okay, best you just listen then. Um, now, this retroviral RNA can integrate itself into our own DNA. And when it's inside our DNA, it will cause our cells to produce more viruses. That's how they reproduce. But the location that the retrovirus can integrate itself um, is key to using it as evidence for evolution. There are over 500 nucleotide sequences that the RNA from a retrovirus is capable of integrating itself. And these retrovirus sequences can be anywhere between uh, 100,000 and 250,000 base pairs long. Now that means that the most conservative calculation, there are 50 million locations that this retroviral DNA can insert itself. So given that there are that many possibilities, I think it's fair to say that the integration point is pretty random. Now, if this integration occurs in a cell that goes on to lead to the production of an egg uh, in a female or in a male, you know, the, the sperm. His juice, juice, as it were. Yes. Yeah, okay, boys, I didn't really want to get too graphic, though. Um, anyway, as I was saying, if the integration happens in a point where a man produces, you know, his sperm... His wonder stuff. Yeah, thank you. So, as I was saying, if this integration occurs in a cell that's going to lead to the production of a sperm or egg, it's going to be passed on to our offspring. Now, let's look a little bit deeper. Once integrated, the retroviral DNA has the following three features. It has the GAG gene, it has the POL gene, and it has the ENV gene. Now, when we're analysing somebody's genome and we find these genes, we know they are viral insertions for the following reasons. The GAG gene serves only one purpose, and that is to produce a nucleocapsid that protects the genetic material of the retrovirus. It has absolutely no use in non-viral organisms whatsoever. There is no need for it to have been put there. The POL gene codes for an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, and this reverse transcriptase is needed to turn that single strand RNA into double strand DNA before it can be integrated into the host genome. So again, this gene has absolutely no purpose in a non-viral organism. The EMV gene is also a very, very important gene for retroviruses. It allows them to produce glycoproteins that allows the virus to enter a host cell through the cell membrane. Now, it is true that in mammals only, this gene has been reformed and can be used to aid the development of the placenta. But animals like birds and reptiles, again, have absolutely no use for it. It is a completely useless gene. So when we find integrations like this in our DNA, it is 100% obvious that they have come from a virus. So why should you care? I couldn't care less! Well, you should care. You see, because retroviral DNA is so easy to spot in our genome, it allows us to test predictions uh, that evolution would make. Um, let's show you what I mean using this monophyletic tree. So let's imagine that an ERV or endogenous retrovirus integrates itself into organism A's genome. Now, we know that there are millions of places this can happen in. This is entirely random. But evolution predicts that this ERV sequence will be found in all of these organisms. But not only will it be found in those organisms, it will be found in the exact same randomly selected insertion point. And that is what we see. These useless, purposeless chunks of DNA that undoubtedly come from a virus sitting in exactly the same spot. These spots that were a 1 in a 50 million chance. Now, if somebody won the lottery with the same numbers every week for 10 years, you wouldn't call that coincidence. And this would have to be a coincidence on a much, much larger scale. Now, the argument I'm getting from the anti-evolution side of the fence is that this isn't evidence at all. You know, uh, the argument I'm hearing is what's stopping these scientists from finding these insertions and then backward engineering these evolutionary trees to fit the pattern that they would expect from evolution. 
Now, that's not exactly calling scientists liars, but more um, suggesting that they're using their bias when drawing their conclusions, because nobody will call us liars, surely. You lie to kids on a daily basis, Baldy Cats. He literally lies. This conspiracy cats know he's lying. But regardless, this backward engineering argument doesn't really work, uh, mainly because the genetic analysis and this technology came after these evolutionary pathways were already laid out on paper. Um, secondly, it completely ignores the fact that these insertions are in exactly the same random place uh, for these organisms. And thirdly, when a second type of ERV is introduced, let's say here at point C, we would only predict to find the same insertions in the same locations in organisms G and H. If we found it in any other organism in this tree, it would be direct evidence against evolution, but the fact is we never, ever, ever see that. Now, let's add another ERV integration, and another, and another, and what we'll see is they all follow this same pattern perfectly. There are no contradictions whatsoever. And in addition to this, they also match the evolutionary trees predicted by the location of pseudogenes and other DNA sequencing techniques, not to mention also being consistent with fossil records. Now, as predicted by evolution, humans will share ERV sequences with chimpanzees. And we actually share seven, all in those exact one in a 50 million chance, same specific locations in our genome. So what are the chances of that happening? Well, what are the chances of that happening by chance? A bajillion, whatever number. Yeah, like a bajillion to one. Um, and it doesn't stop there. You see, on either side of every single ERV insertion are what we call long terminal repeats, represented in yellow here. These are very long repeated nucleotide sequences and are identical on each side of the insertion. However, as time passes, mutations will affect each long terminal repeat differently, meaning that as time goes on, they become more and more unlike each other. So what other predictions do we think that evolution can accurately make from LTRs? I don't know. Right, I guess I'll tell you then. Evolution predicts that insertions found in organisms here will have identical long terminal repeat sequences, but organisms found here will have a small number of differences between them because of the mutation that's occurred uh, over time. And organisms found here will have even more differences between them. And of course, that's exactly what we see with genetic analysis. It all fits the same pattern. Now, I'll add to that that many ERV sequences have been shown to be harmful when reactivated. And that makes it very, very difficult for me to believe that a creator will have inserted these ERV sequences into our genome when we don't need them and they can potentially be very harmful. So there we have it. These uh, retroviral insertions are super, super strong evidence for evolution. And from a creationist point of view, it makes very, very little sense that they should exist in our DNA at all. Um, now, I'm going to stop here and not give any more evidence for evolution because in just a couple of weeks time on a Marvel Girls channel, and I've posted a link in the description, I'm going to be debating this man, Kent Hovind. And I don't want to give him too much of a heads up on all the evidence I'm going to bring. Now, before I sign off, I want to make it very clear that I am not arguing for or against the existence of a creator. I really don't think it's an argument that can be won from either side, and it's, it's just not an argument that I'm interested in having. But what I will say is, if there is a creator, then that creator has left us all of the signposts to tell us that life as we know it today has evolved through the mechanism of evolution. Now, if evolution isn't real, then why would a creator deliberately mislead us by putting those signposts there? And that's kind of the way I look at it. Take care.